Hi, I'm Adam Cohen of datarocks.com and I'm here with Ted Rubin. Ted and I have been talking a long time about the emergence of social media and now how everyone wants it, but the big question is the ROI. Now, what's your standpoint on this? You know, I, I think it goes a little bit deeper than simply the ROI. It also has to do with the budgets and what people are willing to spend. And you know, what I found and is that Everybody thinks that most major brands base what they do in marketing strictly on ROI. But the truth of it, a recent study that was done by um, the AMA and Columbia University, is that most major CMOs, most CMOs from Fortune 500 companies, make their decisions two ways. Number one, they base it on last year's budget, and they redo the budget basically with last year's budget, and maybe they shave off a little bit in one way or another for something. Or number two, they do what a lot of us really understand deeply, they go with their gut. So I think a lot of this, the ROI is important, but a lot of it is getting to the right people and getting them to understand what the true value is of, of what we're doing. And I think we were having a talk about it just a few minutes ago, and I brought up the point of, of loyalty and trust, right? And I know that you experience that in a lot of what you do, that th th this rush for ROI, where because we're trying to measure it, what I find, to what we did before. I, I think we're like that in everything we do in life. We want everything to be like what we did previous to it. So when I first got involved in digital in 1997 at Yo-Yo with Seth Godin, everybody took the, the start of digital and what do you think CPMs came from? It came from magazine sales. And, and I was trying to sell click-throughs at the time. Nobody knew what they were. They didn't understand what it meant to do that. And what's happening with social now is that digital's gotten so ingrained that we want social to match digital. So it's about click-throughs, it's about views, it's about impressions. But it works very, very differently and we've got to figure out new ways to measure it and then take it and lead it into how does that lead to trust, loyalty, and then into sales. So now one thing that we talk a lot about is when that turns into that loyalty, it becomes a relationship. And one of your, the big thing that I know Ted Rubin for is the return on relationship. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about ROR? Well, you know, ROR, simply put, is the value that's, um, that, that's gained by a brand or an individual by building relationships, sharing, um, um, loyalty, um, telling their friends about it. You know, this is something that's really, really important. And we all know that we like to do business more with people we like than people we don't like. It's a natural thing. You prefer to shop at a store where you, you like the vendors. Price is important, but you also want to feel good. And you want to feel that people are listening to you, that they're hearing you, that they care about what you're doing. And that's where I take the relationship side. And then again, I try to bring it to help brands understand, I try to talk about their legacy loyalty programs and what they used to do in the, and the numbers they put behind how the loyalty that was brought in with those programs increased average order size, increased the size of cart, um, extended um, uh, lifetime value of a customer. And if I can get them to recognize that, understand that that all comes from relationships and unlike the loyalty programs of old where we only interacted with them when we bought something or when we traveled on an airline, now they can be building that every day by bringing value to people, by engaging with them, by bringing them valuable content, by showing them things that can help them make their lives easier. And when you get that kind of emotional connection, it's the same thing as loyalty in a loyalty program. And, and another thing I think is that I think a lot of brands are putting it too much on whether it's the content producers, the bloggers, the media companies, or the agencies for them to figure out the ROI. The brands themselves have to figure out the ROI. They've got multi-million dollar budgets. They need to start taking some money and allocating it to doing a program only on social and nowhere else and seeing how it raises the bar, how it increases sales. We've been fortunate enough to have some of that happen at Collective Bias with companies like Glidden, like Tyson, like Elmer's, where they've done programs where they've come back to us and they've told us how we've increased sales, what, you know, what we've done to lift sales at a location within a week, within a month. And then they, what they do is they take that and then they apply it when they're doing a program where we're not the only venue, they're the only marketing medium they're using. I don't know if you've been able to do any of that stuff with what you're doing. So what I've been able to do is, what I, what I tend to do is I look at my brand, because my brand is a really strong, heavily focused, dad-oriented brand. And I look at how I'm engaging the brand differently through a male point of eyes, and they've typically seen through mom blogs or other parent or lifestyle outreach. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make them very hyper aware of the dad focus, that the dad is a rising purchasing group. I know that we, we could go back and have that debate, but they are a rising purchasing group as the economy changes, as the, as the recession kind of steers jobs and steers stay-at-home dad numbers up. 
And I think we are seeing more fathers involved as we start getting to this new plateau of parenthood as it's more 50-50, more sharing instead of like, okay, the male always have these traditional stereotypical roles. And I think we're starting to see that. So what I'm trying to do is evolve the brand to start thinking, maybe it is time to be father focused for a little bit. And some brands have been very effective on that and some brands have stumbled along the way. You know, I'd like to clarify something. Okay, first of all, I do agree with you that the influence of dads in the purchase, purchasing decisions, even the day-to-day -day purchasing decisions, the grocery shopping, it's definitely increasing. What I like to say is that it's still so heavily weighted to the women is why when dads will sometimes say, you know, why don't the brands listen to us more? It's not because they shouldn't be, it's because they tend to put their dollars where it's, they think it's best spent or there's the lowest hanging fruit. But I think dads are also important, but wouldn't you say, as a dad blogger, and there's a lot of other dad bloggers that you know that a big part of your audience is also women. Absolutely. So, so you're not just speaking to dads, you're also speaking to the moms. And that was, you know, part, part of being at Blog World is we're both speakers and part of my session yesterday was actually saying that 60% of my audience for datarocks.com is female oriented. So, you know, like that, that's a real truth that females are reading dad blogs more so than dad blogs are being read. But I think, the, I think for me what it is, is also shows about who's the catalyst to sit there and say the example of like, hey, husband, come look, look at what this guy's doing. Maybe you should like kind of pick up like this. So I do think there's a beacon and I do think there's a trust factor to it. Now one thing I, I would like to get to uh, while we have just a couple of minutes left here, is I, I want to go through a little tip guide of like, what do you think the best three tips that you would advise a blogger that's trying to make it through that next you know, wave of, you know, that wall of hurt that bloggers go through? They, hit, they get to a point and they get a brick wall. What, what do you think three tips that you would advise bloggers that are kind of starting out to get to that next level would be? You know, I think the most important thing, and I see this not happening a lot, and you'd think it would be obvious, is making themselves accessible. I find so many bloggers think that they're protecting their privacy by not having their full name on their card, not saying where they live. You know, what I like to say to them is, the bad people will always be able to find you. But the brands are not going to take that extra step. So, uh, making yourself accessible by having a card that has all the information. You, you don't want to give me your home address, give me your city and state. Give me a phone number, don't leave your phone number off of that blog. Don't think I know you by your blog name. And I got to tell you, I've had this conversation with some bloggers that have gotten past that point you're talking about, but they still complain to me, they don't make enough money. But in one sentence, they'll say they don't make enough money. In the next sentence, they'll say, well, I don't have to put that information on my card. Everybody knows where to find me. And that, so that's, that's one that's really, really important. Number two, I think, is that they need to communicate. I learned this from my daughters. And I learned a real valuable lesson. I have teenage daughters. I'm a divorced dad. You know that. And I started learning that I need to communicate with my daughters the way they want to communicate if I want them talking to me. So they want to communicate via text, and I communicate via text. So I think bloggers all have to learn is they have to find the way each particular brand likes to communicate best and do that for them. So if it's by telephone, then be open to using the telephone. I mean, so many people forget that we have this really unique application that's available on the iPhone. You can put it to your ear and hear people speak. It's unfucking believable You can hear intonation. You can hear laughter. It's an amazing thing, and if everybody's afraid of it. I challenge people at conferences to make a call every day to somebody they haven't spoken to, and I get tweets saying they're breaking out into a cold sweat. So I think that's really important. And another thing is start following those brands and making them aware of you. Don't just call them on the phone. Follow them on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter. Retweet their tweets. Help them with Pinterest. Do stuff for them without working for them, but helping them extend their brand just by using your base and your platform and your followers to get them to notice you. I, mean, that's I love that. I think, I think those are three great points. So have a concise business card that has all your information. Being really upfront and going the extra mile in terms of your communication, pick up the phone. I, you know, I hear that a lot from every brand I call is that they totally were not you know, expecting a phone call from me, but they got it. And then finally is be an advocate for the brands that you really want to work with. I think those are three great tips. Ted Rubin, thanks so much. And thanks. I just want to say that I'm the Chief Social Marketing Officer of Collective Bias. I've known Adam for a long time. He does great work and really happy to be here at Blog World Expo. And Adam Cohen for datarocks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.